Hi, and welcome to the webinar series, Writer to Agent, created by the Association of Writers and Writing Programs in affiliation with Folio Literary Management. We very much hope you enjoy our presentation. So today, we're gonna to be talking about the various paths to publishing. All manuscripts aren't created equal and either are publishers. So this is going to be a brief overview of what's involved in the various um, players. So first of all, I guess I should tell you a little more about me. I'm Jeff Kleinman and I'm a founding partner here at Folio. And I'm here with... Annie Huang. I am a literary agent here at Folio and I'm also our digital rights director. Um, today we're going to start off by talking a bit about traditional publishing. Um, and this is the established way that a publisher goes about acquiring books from writers just like you. Um, there are lots of different types of traditional publishers and Jeff is going to tell us a bit about the different types and how to know what might be best for your project. So there are a bunch of different categories and um, these are sort of rough categories that I don't know how um, there's people that will drop in between these things so it's just but use this as sort of a rough guideline. Um, this, the five t publishers that we've narrowed that we've discussed here are the national trade publishers, regional publishers, smaller publishers, specialty publishers, and university publishers. So first of all we have big national trade publishers. And what are these Jeff? What are these Jeff? Um, there's At this point there's five of them. Um, back a few years ago there were probably 50. Uh, the joys of, of publishing, it, it just get more and more exciting, I guess. Um, at this point, we're down to Penguin Random House, which a couple years ago was a place called Penguin and another place called Random House, and now they're the biggest publisher. Then we have Simon & Schuster, Macmillan, Hachette, and HarperCollins. Um, the, thing, the thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about big publishers is, is your book something that would go to a national audience? Is it going to appeal to people in Florida and Alaska and any place in between? So um, that is really kind of the critical thing to keep in mind. The other critical th thing to keep in mind is distribution. It used to be, up to a few years ago, that the only way anybody would have a book is if you went to a bookstore and purchased it. And the trade publishers were the ones that had the monopoly on the Barnes and Nobles and remember Borders, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and the independent bookstores, the other places to purchase books. So you, as an individual, couldn't get to those places, and other people couldn't find them otherwise. So really, the national trade publishers were the way to go. So that's the first kind. The second kind is something we call regional trade publishers, which are a more specialty group, and they appeal more to a specific region of the country. So I had an author several years ago who um, published books set in the North Carolina beach community. And you could go to any local, not even bookstore, you go to any local beach place, and there is a copy of his book at the front of the counter. Mm -hmm. And every month, he would, um, or every six months, he would get a nice royalty check for those books because the publisher knew how to get to those very specific mom and pop outlets sitting at the beach where the Simon and Schuster's and Macmillan's might not have that kind of area. And why is that? Um, you I mean, think about it. You're dealing with a national basis, you're dealing with a national distribution as opposed to something much more regional and you can really, really target it. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be a great way of going. If you are doing some book that's beer, beer making in Baltimore, you know, people in Ohio or Utah might not care, but people in Baltimore would. And you'd be able to really drill into each of those craft beer establishments in a way that Simon Schuster just doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to do. That's really cool. Well, let's talk a bit about a different type of category. Yeah, so I did this book, I'm one of these crazy horse people, and I did a book a bunch of years ago called Bomb Proofing Your Horse. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody needs Snickers when they hear that title. <laughs> but um, it is a book that teaches you how to basically train your horse so a bomb could go off underneath him and he wouldn't spook, he wouldn't jump. So if Simon & Schuster had done that, 
they wouldn't know how to publish that. They wouldn't know where to go with it. And more importantly, horse people don't buy necessarily books through Barnes and Nobles. They buy them through tax shops. You mm -hmm. go to your local tap shop and you, you find the book. So they go to a specific audio, they go to a specific venue. And the thing about niche publishers is they know how to get to those people. So this book has been in print forever and has done incredibly well for this author, and it would be a terrible mistake if you were at Simon & Schuster. So what would you say, now that we've covered both regional presses and specialty presses, are the, are the differences between those two? Um, regional presses are going to focus more on a region of the country, and specialty presses are going to focus more on a subject matter. Okay, great. Small presses. So small presses are... Um, They're often run by just a handful of people. They might not have the, the ability to get the books well-reviewed. Um, they may not have the connections to get to, to the bloggers or to the different marketing or publicity mm -hmm. venues. Um, but the nice thing about them is it's a great way of getting your feet wet. You can get some great blurbs. You can get, your, you can get some traction. Um, this, the downside dealing with smaller presses is that if you don't sell a lot of copies of the book, um, Barnes and Noble or some of the other book buyers may say, hmm, they didn't sell many copies. I wonder if uh, the next book they'll be able to sell more copies. So it's just something to be aware of, um, that people are paying attention to the numbers. And totally you can go and say, oh, well, you know, it's a smaller press. They didn't have the distribution. They didn't, you know, have the kind of muscle that a Hachette would have. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't... Uh, um, preclude the Hachettes from trying to buy them. So it's just something to be aware of, though. Great. Let's talk a bit about university presses. Yeah, so university presses I th are, in many ways, the best of many worlds. They do very high-quality books. They can get, a lot of times, the kind of national distribution that a trade press can get. Um, the difference is, is that they really often focus on their core specialties. They may have a more elaborate process for just having the book accepted. They may have to have colleagues read it who have similar credentials and sign off on what the book is saying. Um, and you may just have to have a PhD. Um, sometimes they really want that as well. Um, they, they do keep books in print for a long time and they can do a great job. So all of these things seem to me to be very valid depending on your book. So what I would suggest to you as the writer is really figure out which publisher would be better for you. So turning the tables on this now, Annie, it's time for me to ask you questions. E-publishing. Great. Digital publishing. Um, I feel like this is a landscape that has grown and changed and shifted a lot, especially over the past five to ten years. And now, you know, before when you would talk about digital publishing, it was, you know, most of what we talked about was self-publishing. But now the digital publishing aspect has really, um, really grown to kind of encompass several things. So, so um, just really briefly, if you can run down just what the big topics are, mm -hmm. and then we'll kind of break into each one. Sure. So the first one is just e-publishing and there are this is essentially where you publish something um, that is digital and you partner with uh, a traditional publisher so to speak with that um, and so there are several different modes so the first is working with a digital only imprint at a trade publisher so this would be like Simon & Schuster or Hachette um, just like they have you know different imprints for trade publications they also have different um, digital only imprints the, the model is slightly different um, in terms of the advance and the royalties. It's usually um, slightly smaller advances, slightly more generous royalties, and they're really expecting you know, the author to come in um, to, to be you know, heavily marketable. Um, they really have to be active. So, tradition, so if it's a digital-only imprint, that would be comparable to like the mass market book a few years ago, right? Exactly. That's a great example. So it has, it's usually something that's genre focused or romance mm -hmm. or westerns or mysteries. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. So first option is traditional publishing with a digital only imprint. What's mm -hmm. next? So the next is um, with what we call e-publishers. Um, so these operate on very much the same um, model as a trade publisher would with the exception of, you know, they publish digital stuff only, but they're an actual publisher. 
Um, so these are great for, you know, e-originals um, and things like that. And they typically have the traditional model of, you know, advance and royalties. Um, but the nice thing about, you know, both of these things that we're talking about right now is you really have a team um, who's investing in you, um, who's partnering with you to put this book out in a really professional way. Okay, so just to make sure I'm clear. So option one is you get a regular traditional publisher and they do a digital imprint, digital only imprint. Mm -hmm. Option two is you do a non-traditional publisher that does its own digital only imprint, basically. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, and option three? Option three, this one has kind of been around for a while. It's, you know, what we in the industry call vanity presses, where you really do pay to have a, your book be published. So you're paying for um, the publisher and their team to work on a book um, with you and to put this book out in a really professional way. Um, and obviously that's very different because the other two models that we just talked about, the traditional publishing with a digital only imprint or with an e-publisher, both of those models, you aren't paying to have the book published. They're paying you to publish your book. So if somebody says to me, hey Jeff, I wanna publish your book, give me $20,000, that would be a vanity press. Exactly. Okay. So what's next on the list? So what's next is what we call true self-publishing or just self-publishing. Um, and this is um, pu publishing your own book through some sort of distribution platform. You know, press or iBooks or KDP, which stands for Kindle Direct Publishing, which is the um, self-publishing branch of Amazon. And essentially, when you th think about you know how you're gonna put the book out, you really are building your own team here. You build it, you have to be it, and you just have to pay for you know the cover, getting things converted, and things like that. So this is the complete opposite of what we were previously talking about, um, where you have a team behind you. Here, you're really creating your own team. You have to be your own marketing person. You have to be your own cover designer. Um, you have to find a way to get the book converted. And if you don't know how to do all those things, you essentially pay for it. Um, so wait, so what's the difference? If I'm paying for this, is that the same as vanity publishing? No. So for a vanity publisher, they take care of all the, the logistics. So they basically charge you a lump sum and they handle everything. And the process is very much like, you know, it would be with a trade a tra tra traditional publisher. Whereas this, you really have to be the one doing all the groundwork, finding what cover designer you want to use, figuring out what image you want to use. Uh, if you don't know how to convert your files, finding a program or, you know, hiring someone to do it. Whereas a publisher, um, even if it's like a vanity press, they would basically be doing all those things for you which would be included in that sum. So are there certain types of authors you think are better for self-publishing than traditional publishing? I do and I think it's um, people who are a little bit more tech savvy, people who are much more um, well versed in how to market themselves, um, people who have understood how to brand themselves and know where their audience is and how to reach them in a really really highly targeted way. Hmm, okay. Before we move on to agent-assisted self-publishing, actually, I wanted to talk quickly about self-publishing. You asked, you know, what model would be best um, or who would be best for self-publishing. Um, the nice thing about this is you don't need an agent to do it. Got it. Okay. Um, and there's also, um, you get higher royalties. So again, you know, when we go back to thinking about, you know, the traditional publishers, they're paying you advance, they're paying you royalties, they're really taking on the risk. Um, they're really hoping that, you know, by paying you this advance, the book will do well and they'll recoup the cost. Um, with self-publishing, um, you yourself are taking on the risk and the cost. Um, but the nice thing about that is you get a bigger piece of the pie. Got it. Okay. So the risk might be worth it. Yep. So finally, we're getting to agent-assisted self-publishing. So this is um, a special branch of self-publishing that is really only for authors who already have representation. Um, so there are certain perks that come with this. Um, you get to be the publisher. You own the work. Um, but you have a team behind you, which means that, you know, you're not alone. You have an agent and, you know, hopefully someone like me to guide you through the process, you know, of picking out what the cover should look like, figuring out what the price point should be, um, figuring out what the cover copy should look like and things like that. Um, there are also um, certain perks like Amazon's White Glove program, which is just for um, authors who are already represented by agents and they offer certain services for free like cover design or file conversion and formatting 
um, and sometimes even special marketing placement on their website. Um, and this is really under the assumption that there's a certain quality to the level of writing and that they may be able to build on an author's existing brand, hopefully. Okay. Um, and that kind of leads us to hybrid publishing. Um, so, so, Annie, what is hybrid publishing? Hybrid publishing um, is a hybrid between self-publishing and traditional publishing. Um, and so it's for authors whose books are traditionally published with a trade press, like the ones that you mentioned. Um, and it's these people also have books that are self-published that they do on their own on the side. And the really nice thing about this is, you know, you can have a very symbiotic relationship um, amongst all your titles where, you know, let's say, you know, Jeff, you've had experience with this where you have um, a client whose book is coming out from, you know, Simon & Schuster, but, you know, or there's a promotion going on. And if you let me know, I can, you know, basically work with them to make sure that all that attention gets spread out towards his other titles and that his other titles um, get some attention from that as well. So it causes kind of like a halo or what we call a ripple effect, hopefully. So just give me an example using like uh, BookBub, for instance, just so people understand how that works. Sure. Um, so to talk really quickly about BookBub, BookBub is an email subscription service for readers um, who are looking for deeply discounted ebooks. So this is a service that you can subscribe to. You get a daily or weekly or monthly digest that's filled with um, a list of deeply discounted ebooks that you have indicated that you're interested in. So you can imagine it's not just great for readers, it's also really great for these authors whose books are being featured on BookBub. Um, so for instance, Jeff, you know, if you have a client who has um, a frontless title with a trade press and it's being featured on BookBub, I can essentially, you know, take a look at his backlist titles that we've self-published and, you know, I can kind of piggyback off of that. So, you know, if people are looking at his front list title and they're seeing that it's discounted, it'll also show up that, you know, this other title that's also by this author is also discounted. And it'll really incentivize readers who are already interested in his books to buy his other books. Got it. Okay. Just to sum things up. Um, with traditional publishing, authors receive more money up front. Um, E-publishing, they receive less money up front or mm -hmm. no money up front. Um, the author has a team behind them for traditional publishing, whereas with self-publishing, um, with e-publishing, e it will depend. And with self-publishing, you have to kind of build your own team. Exactly. And um, the other piece is that with traditional publishing, you just have a broader range of distribution channels, both print and electronic. Whereas with e-publishing, you have electronic, and then you have something called print-on-demand. So briefly, what is how does print-on-demand work? So print-on-demand um, is pretty self-explanatory. It, it is, as the name indicates, um, in traditional publishing, um, and Jeff, feel free to jump in at any time, um, when a, well, first of all, let's talk about production time really quickly. It takes, you know, usually between signing of the contract to when the book comes out, about 18 months to two years. And once the book is actually printed, they print um, a certain number of copies and then these are stored in warehouses. Well, fiction, I mean, the contract signed and then it's the book usually comes out about a year afterwards, somewhere mm -hmm. between six months to a year. Okay. But then, um, obviously, then we have distribu distribution, et cetera. So, sorry, right. go on. Well, the biggest thing is um, there are costs associated with having these books being printed and then shipped to the warehouses and then being stored at the warehouses. They take up space, which costs money. The nice thing about print on demand is unless somebody orders it, it's not manufactured. So it's not until somebody clicks the buy button um, that this book is physically produced. Um, so you can imagine how much money um, you're saving on the back end. Got it. And those savings usually go into the author's pocket. So that's sort of a brief rundown of traditional versus e-publishing. And now, I thought we'd talk briefly about the future of publishing, what it will look like. My head starts hurting immediately. <laughs> we don't really know where things are going to go. It feels like there's a lot of different possibilities. It feels like ebooks are going to stay around, but so is print. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like um, you know certain trends are going to taper off right now. And 2017, dark psychological suspense is like the is the one of the big buzzwords it's one of the things people are looking for but yeah. tomorrow it'll be comedy or romance or something yeah and I also want to say uh, a really big trend that's that's 
really happening right now is the rise of audiobooks. You know, um, a lot of people are likening this buzz around audiobooks to you know the whole buzz around ebooks ten years ago or so. Um, and I think that even the next couple of years, um, the entire audio industry will start to shift a little bit, you know, and the way that ebooks came around because people started being able to, you know, open up their phones or open up, you know, read on reading devices and really read anywhere on the go digitally. Um, audiobooks really with the listening devices that we have now, not just your phone, but, you know, these devices like Alexa or Amazon Echo or... Um, Google Home, things like that. Um, it, audio is just becoming so, so popular. Um, what are some other cool trends? Uh, it, I mean, I guess the thing is, is that it, no matter what the trend is, it feels like something new is going to be starting soon. And yeah. it just feels like that, no matter what you do, that's where it's going. But I guess to me, the big takeaway is, um, I don't know about you, but I've been hearing books are dying for the last like 300 <laughs> years. But they keep they keep going on, and I think the reason is because people want stories. They want a narrative. They want to make sense of their lives and the world around them through a story. And I think that's what we offer them. So thank you all for your time, Annie. Thank you for doing this with thank me. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll catch you soon. Take care. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments or you want to submit anything to Folio, don't hesitate to reach out to us at awp at foliolitmanagement.com. Or if you want to reach out to AWP directly, they can be contacted at awp at awpwriter.org. Thanks again and hope we hear from you soon. Take care.